Alright, alright, alright. Thank you, everybody. Let me see. This is my first time using this thing. Can you guys hear me? Is it on? Alright. No, I, I felt good because Brad came in with the headset. I'm like, you know what? It's about time I get some respect around here. I, I get the headset. No more am I. You know, I've, I've been here for so long and I, I've moved up. But um, on a serious note, you know, uh, I am 20 years young. Uh, years young. I like to say years young because uh, I don't want to think of myself as old, even though uh, Jonas often calls me an old man, unfortunately. <laughs> but in my 20 years, there are a lot of things that I have found to be truly amazing about God. But there's one thing that has kind of stuck out more than the others, and that is God is in control. I am in good hands. Uh, would you guys bow your head and close your eyes? We're going to uh, open up with a word of prayer. Lord, uh, we come before you, God, uh, with humble hearts, Lord, um, that you are truly in control of our lives, God, and there's none other that we will want, God. Uh, your ways are perfect. Uh, your thoughts are great. They're magnificent, Lord. And we love you, and we thank you for everything that you do for us in our lives, God. I just pray that uh, you can speak, God, not Matt, not my words, because my words, they are not good, Lord. They're not worthy, Lord. But you provide us with what we need to live, to be happy, to be joyful, Lord. And uh, we love you, and we thank you so much for, for, for that, God. And it's in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, if you could, turn with me to Psalm 139, 139, 15, and 16. And uh, we're going to be doing a lot of Bible hopping through different passages. Um, but there's key points uh, that I want to point out. Like Brad said, you guys are going to get to know me more. A lot of you guys have seen me, and a lot of you guys have seen me do the skits and the videos with Brad and with John and with Mark. Um, but this is a time uh, not only as my last week here in Florida before I leave, but a time for you guys to really understand me and know me on a better uh, circumstance. So uh, Psalm 139, uh, 15 and 16. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the room. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in my book. And uh, that speaks volumes to me because it says that nothing is random in our lives. Every situation in our life was planned by God. Before we even took a breath, God thought about it. God decided what is going to be in Matt's life. And things don't seem perfect at all times, but he put them in there for a reason. My first point is random doesn't exist in God's book. No, random does not exist in the Bible, and random does not exist in the book where our stories are recorded. And you see, this truth came to life. When I think back, when I first started coming to a Christian, a, a Christian school, I came here to the Hollywood Christian School, and I was raised in a public school system, so I've barely been to, to, to a church my whole life. I've probably been one time before that that I could really re, re, remember. So I walk in to the classroom. You know, I'm the new kid. You know, of course, all the new kids. So I see everybody turn their heads and they're looking at me and it's just like blank faces. Like, <gasps> new kids. So I'm like, oh man, look at these guys. I didn't feel like I, I, I fit in. You know, because I didn't know anything about God. Not one single thing about God. In fact, this was the first time that I really ever opened a Bible and tried to search for a Bible verse. And I remember uh, I had a, uh, a, a, a quiz verse. Every week, I had to remember a verse. And um, I came home, and I, I was freaking out. I was stressing. I was asking my parents, how do I use this thing? I, I don't even know how to search for this verse. There's different numbers, different books, and I had no clue. And then my parents had to sit down with me, and they had to talk with me. And that to help me search through the Bible. So I'm reciting the verse, I'm memorizing it, and my dad, he's helping me. And I cite the whole verse. I don't know exactly what the verse was, but it was in the book of Psalms. But I'm saying it, and at the time, I called it Paslums. So I recite the whole verse. I go, Paslums, X, Y, and Z. So my dad just starts laughing. He starts cracking up. I'm getting frustrated. I'm like, what? What's so funny? I did it perfectly. That's 100%. So he asks me, what is it called? It goes, called Paslums. He goes, no, no, look again. Like, it's right here. It says Paslums. Paslums is what it's called. So then he had to tell me it is called the Book of Psalms. So that was a fun 
experience, but uh, I made a lot of new friends here. And of course, uh, most of them were Christian, going to a Christian school, and they invited me to church. For the first time, I started to attend church for a Wednesday night, uh, week after week. Um, sadly, the only thing I remember about youth group back in the day was the first day I, I, I came just like this, you know, not just like this, how smaller and different clothes, but I didn't have anything in my hand. You know, and the pastor gave a dollar to every kid who brought a Bible. I remember I was so angry. Like, man, I didn't bring my Bible to church. I think I actually tried to lie to him. Like, yeah, I have it. I just can't find it just to get that dollar. But that's the only thing that I remember about church there. But uh, I continued to go to, to, to this church here. It was actually here uh, until my eighth grade year, the beginning of my eighth grade year. And then I completely stopped. Uh, for whatever reason, I thought I was too cool for church. You know, I found other things. May, it might have been I got bored with it. Uh, I'd rather play video games or hang out with other friends. But I stopped going to church completely at the beginning of my eighth grade year. And looking back, I got to remember God is in control. I am in good hands. The next verse uh, we are going to dig through and look at is Philippians 1.6. Philippians 1, 6. And it should be up on the screen, too, to follow along. And it says, And I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. You, you see, it is the amazing thing about God that God does not give up on us. There are times in our life where it seems like we might be straying off of the path, or going a bit left, or going a bit right, when we should be straight forward on the path God has. And it happens. It's happened to me multiple times. But the awesome thing about God is God pursues us. God loves us enough and cares about us that much that he pursues us, and he is faithful to bring us back onto his path to complete the work he has completed. Uh, in high school, I took a pottery class, and Mrs. Bailey is here, and she was my pottery teacher, and um, I actually really loved that class. It was a lot of fun, but we would have to make a pot on a spin wheel. So, you know, you put your clay on, and then you put the pot, you go, start spinning really fast with the clay, and if you weren't careful and controlling with that clay, it would go flying off. You know, Mrs. Bailey told you, you had to stick it down hard, then you had to seal it with your finger, but if you want to skip a, you know, a step or two steps, and start to spin it, and it goes flying off. And it wasn't until that you brought that piece of clay back on to the wheel that you were able to continue to mold it and shape it. You see, I like to think that that's how we are with God. There's times where we're spinning, we're spinning, we're spinning, and God is trying to work us. We're trying to be, be shaped to the way that he wants us to be, but somehow we go flying off. And God pursues us. He, ch he chases us. He doesn't give up on us. He puts us back on that wheel to continue to shape us and to mold us. And uh, that leaves me with my second point. God does not give up on us. So now, uh, eighth grade year, uh, I stopped going to church completely. Um, I started hanging around my neighborhood friends. Uh, I'm going to the basketball courts a lot. That's pretty much where I lived. And um, I still went to a Christian school, so I still had these Christian school walls and these borders where I played a very good double life, a double-sided life. Where in this Christian school, I like to still act like, you know, I was a good Christian. I was living for God on fire. I had everybody fooled, all my teachers fooled. Uh, but in reality, outside of these walls, I was not living the, Christ that, uh, the life that Christ wanted me to. And uh, my neighborhood friends, they seen that, and they asked me a lot, you're supposed to be a Christian, but you're doing this? I'm like, yeah, yeah, you know, just be quiet. We can talk about that another time. But uh, I think that my mom will be shocked to hear some of the things that I was doing uh, in that time. And she's actually here this evening, uh, but uh, it's nothing too bad. It is safe to say uh, that I never got involved in alcohol or drugs. That is safe to say that's something that... Um, was never a part of me and never found it cool. My friends, they didn't do it. A uh, few of them who did, they didn't peer pressure. I just say, that's not me. But uh, I did go around and vandalize houses. 
you know, uh, egging them, and I throw rocks at people's doors to uh, scare them with a teepee. They're, they're out just getting in a bunch of trouble, slashing tires, e even that's probably the worst thing ever uh, that I had to do, but it was because I wasn't living a life filled with, with the joy that Christ has to. I was a very angry person. I was always trying to pick a fight with somebody. I'll go out the basketball course and they'll say uh, something that I didn't like, but I'll try to instigate it and blow it. You know, I'll say, you know, are you talking to me? And I'll shove them, try to instigate it, because I just wanted to get this built up anger for no reason, just out, out some way, somehow. I was a very uh, selfish and mean person. And now that's a side that my mom has never seen, and she probably can't believe it, but it is the honest truth. Uh, and it might seem that God wasn't even a part of my life or even working in my life at the least, but we have to remember, God is in control. I am in good hands. And it is so wonderful that I serve a God and that we serve a God who does not give up on us. You see, because if I was in control of Brian's life, oh boy, I would get so frustrated to look down and see him sin day after day after day after day. It would frustrate me. I would get so fed up. I'd say, you know what, Brian? That's it. I'm done. And I will move on to someone else. No, that is a complete joke. Brian is awesome. Uh, good leader, good mentor. But, but that is true. If I was in control of someone else's life, they would be doomed. If God was not in control of our life, we will all be doomed. If God gave up on any of us, man, we would be in trouble. Because I know I have failed God multiple times in my story. But he is wonderful. He is faithful. He is just to not forget us. And remember, God is in control. We are in good hands. So I started going back to church in the year of 2010, back here. Uh, God just put it a, a, a feeling on my heart. And at the time, of course, I didn't know it was God. I've been so absent from God for so long. But someone said, Matt, you got to go back to church, man. You've been gone for too long. You know, you might as well just go. So I asked a friend, I said, hey, man, what time does the rock start? And they got real excited, like, oh, you coming to the rock? Like, yeah, yeah, okay, calm down. Let's not make a big thing about that. But uh, so they told me, you know, you come at six, there's hangout time, and service starts at seven. So God put it on my heart to come back to church. But there were still some bumps uh, going back to church. The next verse we're going, to up, we're going to look at is Isaiah 41.10. This has actually become uh, one of my favorite in the whole Bible just because there's so many truths in this one verse and there's so many things that speak out to me and it should be up there on the screen. But verse 10, Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. And the point I want to make there is the last part of the verse. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. And that leaves me with, that, with my third point. God is victorious. You see, God is not a loser. He does not come in second place. Uh, I, was all, I was always taught as an uh, athlete that second place is the first place loser. You never want to come. I'd rather come in third place now than second place because I don't want to be the first place loser because I was that much closer to being the winner. But God is a conqueror. The conqueror over sin, over death, over lives, over hearts, over people. He's conquered it all. He's done it all. And it was at this time that I came back to, 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 uh, to here in 2010 that I had to realize that God is victorious. You, you see, I started to get too comfortable with my relationship with God because uh, he was growing me and he was showing me things and he was uh, correcting me and the Holy Spirit played a, a huge part just saying, Matt, you know, you're, you're a Christian now. You're going back to church. You have to live a certain way. But I was getting too comfortable, like too big from, for, my, for, my, for my pants. I had this huge persona. My head was getting big where I thought I was doing everything right. I'm going to church now. I'm changing my behaviors. I'm not hanging out with my friends that much. I'm not being that, that evil, mean kid that I once was. But in reality, I was angering God. And the reason was because God was still not first in my life. There was a lot of maturity that had taken place, but things became first in my life. And uh, whether it was re uh, uh, friendships, sports, relationships, 
uh, what, whatever it was that was first in my life, it would knock God down to second place or sometimes third place. So over time, uh, God would kind of just, um, just kick him out of the way one by one, smack him out the way one by one. And I was beginning to get very angry with God. I was looking up, man, and I remember sometimes I, I get so angry, I was like threatening to kick God out of my life. I'm like, God, leave. You know, you are taking away these things in my life that brought me great joy. At the time, I didn't know it was because they were first. You know, I was being lied to and deceived for a very long time by the enemy, trying to say, no, Matt, you're doing good. You're doing a good job. You know, the enemy wants us to feel comfortable, like everything's good, but the Holy Spirit tells us the truth, saying, no, Matt, you're not. So he started to knock things out one by one. I was getting so mad with God. And um, soon after soon, he started to regain his rightful place uh, at number one, you know, because that's all God wants to be number one in your life. And it's when he's number one that other things can follow him. You know, if God is number one, you can love people and sports and relationships. You, you can have all that stuff, but it gets dangerous when you allow those things to come in front of God. It kind of sounds like what God did with the golden calf with the Israelites. See, they started to love it so much and to worship it that God said, no, I won't stand for this. I'll take him out because I'm not a loser. I won't come second place to a golden calf, to a cow. <laughs> I mean, at least something like a bear, something more ferocious, something more cool. But God would not stand for a golden calf coming in between them. So uh, God starts to grow me after he takes his first place. He starts to grow me. He, uh, he opens up my eyes. It's so amazing when you see God working in your life and it's kind of like, your eyes are just open, and you see life. Uh, my uncle calls it tunnel vision. He, he, he once told me, Matt, you see life like this. And if you ever put your hands like this, you can see there's a lot that, that you can't see. He said, Matt, you need to see life like this. Open it up. There's a whole world. And then he said, when you get good, you actually can start to see behind you. You can see 360 around you. But he started to grow me, and he gave me... Uh, opportunities become a leader in the, in, the, uh, in the youth group. And man, I loved it. I loved uh, being a volunteer. I loved being um, with Brad every single day. I love it. So now I feel a calling to ministry, you know, to enter into the field of ministry, to go off to college. Uh, at the time, I didn't know what I wanted to be. I just knew I wanted to be in ministry. I've been doing it for two years now. I graduated high school. You know, I've been doing it for about two years now. And like I said, I loved it. There was times where me and Brad were tired. We would pour a 17-hour day here, whether it was doing the stage or doing projects, 17 hours here without sleep, only to go home, get five out more hours of sleep, come back to another 17-hour day. But even in those times that we were tired, I still loved it. It was something amazing about being here, being with him. Wherever he went, I went. We'd go off to a middle school, a public school, and tell public school kids about Jesus Christ. And that was amazing. I loved it just to meet them and interact with, with them and hear their stories. And so I start, uh, I start um, working here, actually. After I became a volunteer, uh, I started to work here full-time on the maintenance team. Mark Metcalf in the back. Woo, woo, woo! Maintenance team. So, yeah, he has some fan supporters. And uh, that was a lot of fun. But as time was passing, I, f I just felt uneasy. I'm like, man, I'm wasting time. Two years out of high school, I feel this calling to ministry. But, man, I am wasting time. Time is slipping from my hands. I'm 20 year, years old. I'm only getting older. You know, there's no re, regression with, with, with it, unfortunately. But um, it's, it's just like, it, it baffled me. So I, I start applying to a few schools, looking into them, start visiting them. And finally, I get accepted by the Moody Bible Institute. Mark Book, hold up in the back, alumni. Uh, I'll be there soon. So I get accepted, man, and it is awesome. I get so excited. I get accepted to one of the best colleges for equipping and developing young adults to enter into the field of ministry. I get so excited. I text my dad. I go, Dad, man, I just got accepted to the college. He shares with me how proud he is. He goes, you know, son, I'm so proud of you. This is awesome. 
I'm the first one in my family to go to college. You know, this, this is a big deal. This is like something that, you know, every family wishes. And he shares with me, he goes, man, it's always been one of my dreams as a father to take my kid to a college. So I'm getting more excited. I'm like, man, this is awesome. I get to fulfill one of your dreams while fulfilling one of my dreams. Two birds with one stone, boom, boom, bang. That's how we do it. <laughs> but 10 days after this, my father passes away. So it's only normal to think through this in a logical way. I've seen God work in my life for the past five years. I've been a volunteer in ministry serving God for the past two years. God has called me to ministry and proven it by allowing me to get accepted to one of the best colleges in the country for what I want to go into. Then my father passes away. It did not add up one bit. But we will look into another verse because there's a happy story uh, to that. Uh, it's sad, you know, I miss my father a lot, thinking about him every single day. Uh, but I'm making him proud. I'm making him very proud. But turn with me to Psalm 23, 4. It is a verse that, uh, it is a passage that we're all familiar with. But there is an amazing truth uh, in this passage, and it will be up on the screen, hopefully. Uh, 23, 4. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. And that leaves me with my, first, my fourth point. We have nothing to fear. Why? Because God is in control. I am in good hands. We have nothing to fear. The same night that my father passed, I went outside and I talked to God. I, you know, it just felt right. It felt so important. Talk to God in this moment. Because one of my darkest moments so is one of my most angry moments, my most confused moments. So I talk to God and I tell God, you know, God, I'm not mad at you. I can't be. I said, God, I'm not mad at you because I've been mad at you in the past. And that didn't go so well. I've learned my lesson. You've matured me. So God, I'm not mad at you. I confirmed to God that I know that everything works for good for those who love you. And I love you, God. I still love you. You're still number one in my life. I'm still chasing you. And this is my conversation with God. I said, God, I know everything works for good. But I asked him, I need to know how this is going to work for good, Dad. Uh, God. I said, God, just share with me that. I need your love and your peace. And that's all I need. You see, because the enemy wanted me to fear. Because when you have fear in your body, you lose all form of trust. Uh, I kind of thought through this, and it's kind of like in a movie where someone falls off the edge of a cliff, like a thousand foot cliff. But then the friend lo looks over the cliff, and the one who fell is hanging off by a tree or by a branch. Coincidentally, there's that one root, that one tree that's growing up that he's hanging through. And the friend leaps, reaches his arm down and says, grab my hand, grab my hand. Never does the friend just go up and reach. There's always that hesitation because they have fear in their body. And they tend to lose trust in everything, even one of their best friends. So the grip is fading and they're sliding down, they're sliding down. And it's almost to the point where they're about to lose grip completely and fall down and die, where they say, you know what? I might as well trust because that's all I got now. So they leave, but they grab their arm and they are able to bring their friend back up. The enemy wants you to fear so you lose trust in God. You see, but I didn't lose trust in in uh, so I got. I kept the faith. I kept on going. And uh, when, when you keep your trust in God, when you keep your faith in God, you will see amazing things happen in your life. Say, Matt, how do you know that? Because I've seen it. People were asking me, Matt, how are you going to pay for your college? I told them, I'm not going to pay for it. And they go, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Matt, come on now. You said you're going to college. There's a fee that has to be due for you to go, but you say you're not going to pay it? I said, I can't pay it. I don't got the money to pay it. There's no way I could pay it. You know, my friends, they started looking at me like I'm crazy. Like, Matt, you feeling good? You know, you've been fishing in that hot sun for way too long. You need to have some water, sit down, take a nap. But I said, no, I'm not going to pay for it because God is going to make it happen. God's going to make a way to pay. It just felt right. It felt so strong. I thought God has brought me this far why would he abandon me now? I told people, I'm not going to pay for it because God is going to make a way for it in my life. And it is huge 
to say that uh, God has provided for my college, not for one year, but for three years. Bang, 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 that's what happens when you do not feel. That is what happens when you do not feel. So throughout all of this, I can't help but think, God is in control. I am in good hands. There's one last verse um, I want to go, go, go to. It won't be up on the, uh, on the, on the screen there. It was kind of a last-minute verse, but 2 Timothy 4.7, if you would like to turn there. 2 Timothy 4.7. And it says, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have remained faithful. It tells us, fight the fight, run the race, keep the faith. And you will see God do amazing things in your life. Because you know, I have an amazing story, and it's a long one. No, just the fact that I was able to come to a Christian school, that's not coincidental. God put that in my life so I could meet people and that I could actually come to church for the, few, for the first time. Every situation in our life, you got to run that race through every hiccup, every speed bump. Keep the faith. Run the race. Do not give up because God never gave up on you. And in your moment, you might sit back and say, man, I've been through some way worse stuff, and I believe it. Because my story is not that bad. It's awesome. I love my story. Because God has done amazing things in my life. And I've seen God do amazing things. And last week we watched a movie here, God's Not Dead. And it's such an encouragement to actually see that God isn't dead. The youth group has an amazing team of adults that we come together to help the kids. And we brainstorm week after week. And we actually had a meeting the other week. It was the best meeting we ever had. And I was getting so mad because Brad was asking us these questions that seemed to make no sense. And me and John, we had to go outside and we had to help out with some trash or the car. We had to fix a car. And I was saying to, to John, kind of, you know, venting a little bit, I said, I don't know what Brad's trying to do here, man. It's making no sense. Every answer that we give is the wrong answer. But it was so fun just to brainstorm uh, through the questions, and the topic was, what, what was the topic? Why are people disconnected from God? Yeah. That, that, that was the topic. What is the dis- So we're saying, oh, sin, oh, friends, oh, peer pressure. And so all they're seeing, and Brad kept on saying, I don't think that's it. Uh, I'm, I mean, I'm leaving like five of them, and finally I give up. I just stop talking, I lean back, <laughs> let some other people, and we go outside like, John, man, this guy's crazy. This guy is crazy, but... It is amazing just to see that God's really not dead. He's still working in the lives of young people. And we see God working in the lives of a lot of students, all the students' lives that we have. Um, and as one reminder, one last time, God is in control. We are in good hands. You must always trust God through the good and through the bad. And I started thinking one day, why do bad things happen to Christians, you know, Good things are supposed to happen. The only thing I can think of is, well, there's many things, but one thing important is heaven's not meant for weak people. You know, the word is very clear on telling us that there will be trials, there will be tests in the Christian's life. God calls the strong. God calls the bold. Heaven isn't meant for the weak. You know, it takes a lot to be a Christian because you want to turn your back on God, you want to point the fingers, nothing's wrong with us, it's all you, God. But it is meant for the strong. He strengthens us so that on that day we can be strong enough to walk through those gates. Fight the fight, run the race, keep the faith. God is in control. We are in good hands. Will you bow your head and close your eyes? In this moment, I'm going to let you guys take a minute, just in your own words, you know, because I could say a prayer to close it, but in your own words, just thank God for being in control. Thank God for the situations he has brought you through. Thank God for being these wonderful hands that wrap you and they caress your heart and they love you and they care about you. Just thank God in those moments for what he has done in your life. Lord, we all love you, God. You are truly amazing. And just to see you work in people's life is an amazing thing. Me and Brad, Brad has, has showed me and he's taught me a lot and he has guided me, Lord. And there's no better feeling than seeing God work in someone's life. For me, personally, I love it. I get so excited. 
And God, you are awesome, Lord. And I just pray, Lord, that anything going on, Lord, a hiccup, a speed bump, something that doesn't make sense, God, can come clear, Lord. I pray that we can all run the race, fight the fight, and stay faithful to you, to your word, to what you say, Lord. And then amazing things will happen, not because I say so, but because your word says it, God. And you are faithful, God. You promise us things, and you uphold it. Throughout the whole Bible, you promise, and you've kept them all, Lord. We love you, and we thank you, and it is in Christ Jesus' name, all his children said, amen.